Welcome to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. Before we start today's episode, I would just like to extend my sincere thanks to everyone who has been patiently awaiting new episodes. And this one is something a wee bit special. Today, I have the honour of featuring the wonderful music of Ian Fontova and his album, Tales of Olden. I've had the pleasure of featuring Ian's music in past episodes, I think you'll agree his work really is amazing. I can only dream of playing a single instrument, while Ian is the master of many. You can find videos featuring music both new and old over on Ian's YouTube channel. It's under Ian Fontova Valero Music, and I'll include the link in today's show description. Ian and I very much hope that you enjoy this episode. It was a lot of fun for us to work in this together. Some of you might recognise names, places and themes that helped to create this episode from the legendary tales and folklore of Scotland and Ireland. The work of Otto Swire, Donald A. Mackenzie, James McKinley, Patrick Weston-Joyce, George MacDonald and Lady Gregory helped to inspire our tale. We've included some sources for you in the show description, as well as links to Ian and Tales of Olden. As always, please do feel free to get in touch. We would love to hear your thoughts. But for now, enjoy Tales of Olden. Celtic Riders Let us now recall those times, those distant tales of Olden. When the seas were vast and billowing, when the earth was still unbroken, beneath skies that stirred with mist, beneath that orb of burning light, where the heavenly others did exist, and impart their will and might. Hear of mortals who fought so well, who lived and loved and died, who rode aback the thunderous hooves, Carved ships from landed seas. Join us now. Sit for a while. Hear the songs and tales of those who dwelled in the far distant past and whose memory still holds.
Clans of Ulaith. In the north of Eira, and a little to the east, there was a man by the name of Khorne. He was a swift-footed warrior, wise and just in all things, and a chieftain of Ulaith. At that time, there were many clans with an eye on the northernmost kingdom. Attacks were frequent, and many were lost in battle. There came a night when no matter how he tried, Khan could not rest, and so he rose from his sleeping place to sit by the fire. In his eyes, the smouldering embers of peat glowed, while his mind clouded with sadness and regret. It seemed to him the battle crows were circling, those harbingers of doom, and death was soon approaching. A chill crept over his skin and settled in his bones. Pulling his woolen cloak about his shoulders, Con returned his gaze to the fire. For a moment he thought he heard the beating of a bird's wings, but saw nothing in the shadows as he looked from one end of the hall to the other. A figure slid onto the bench beside him, whose cloak and hood were so heavy he could not discern if it were a man or woman seeking the warmth of the fire. Battle weary, eyes laden with the dew of woe, and still so many days ahead. Con of Ulith, who has fought bravely in the name of his forefathers, what say you to knowing of death as I do? Con replied, You're no stranger to me, or to the men whose weapons and wounds grace this hall, and yet I've no need of what you offer. You love your land more than these people. I warned your father, Antis, and had thought you a different kind of man. Khan straightened his long back and broad shoulders, furrowed his dark brows and tugged at his soot-black beard. Let me see your face, he said. The figure pushed the hood back. There are those who choose not to listen. Are you one of those, Khan, son of Cormac? Well, I wash your shroud in the Ulaith Ford. Khan surveyed the woman before him. She was neither beautiful nor haggard. Her eyes were not shining or milky. Her thin smile resembled a grimace, and yet it switched with humour. He reached out a hand to turn her chin, followed the sharp outline of her features, and found his fingertips were cold and her skin as thin as overstretched hide. You appear untouched by the passage of time, and yet, never have I felt so small in the presence of another, said Con. As the woman turned away, she said, You have a choice to make. The clan must leave this place, this very night. But, leave or stay, your people will be the last of their kind. That is no choice at all, Con replied. The woman had yet more to say. As she drew her next breath, the very life of the room, of the woods, fields and mountains, shrouded in the curtain of night, seemed to wane. The light that was the moon, the stars, dimmed as the words fell from her mouth. In the beginning, among those who fought, I was the greatest of women. Five, the goddess of battle. And with the power of our enchantments, my sisters and I brought forth mists and clouds of darkness over the land, 
fire and blood to be rained down over our foe, so they could neither see nor speak for the length of three days. Now there comes another to replace what was, so that I and my sisters are little more than the wail of a banshee in the night, little more than the cry of crows over fields drenched in corpse dew. The Midland Kingdoms have set their sights upon the land of Ulaith. This much you know. I have swayed the outcome of every confrontation in your favour, but no more. The battle crow I may be, but not when the fight has left the hearts who dwell here. For generations I have warned your kin. I shall counsel your clan no longer. Before Con could reply, the woman stood, wrapped her raven cloak about her slight form, and pushed open the heavy wooden door. As the ghostly glimmer of moonlight danced over her shape, she transformed into a raven and flew out into the night. Sailors of Danane The Isle of Danane was said to lie far across the sea, and in waters abound with danger. The ship carrying Con and his followers was tossed between thrashing waves and winds that lashed their skin with salt. Eyes stung, red-rimmed and raw from the winter's fury, lips cracked, and tongues were parched by the brine. Dunane, but why? What do you know of this place? Con's men cried as they steadied themselves aboard. 
None will think to search for us there. Con shouted over the shrieking gale. None have ever found it, roared the men, spittle on their beards, hair stuck to their heads, drenched clothing clinging to their backs. Then we'll be safe, laughed Con, as he leaned into the wind. There, see the firelight of Dalriada. Now we push on to Danain. The eyes of the crew saw the wavering firelight on the distant shore. The words in the throat of each man was stop. They mean to warn us. We must go no farther. But not a single one among them spoke their fears. As the crewmen battled with the ship, women and children huddled in cramped corners of the vessel, shoulders pressed, Bags hunched over as arms wrapped around bodies for life and limb. Con had taken with him his most loyal men and their kin. The weight of this threatened his boldness. He felt sure the whites of his eyes, his bared teeth and clenched fists, betrayed him. Gradually, the wavering firelight disappeared. The sky grew darker still. And when it seemed the storm would not abate, the cry of seabirds were heard overhead, and the tumult surrounding them became calm. The clouds, thick and grey with unspent fury, parted to reveal an ocean of azure, and the hearts of those weary travellers soared. Tell us, Con, now that we might survive this, why that island? asked Phelum, the most loyal of his men. As a boy, when my father was already dead, my grandfather would tell me about the gods, their wars and every realm beyond this. No tale remained with me so clearly as that of Danain. You see, Phelum, the isle can only be found by the worthy. Time there does not pass as it does for us. It is alike to your Nanog, filled with men and women. You want to live, without the curse of iron slung about their necks. You've lost as much as I have, more than some on the ship. But I know of none who are as worthy of peace as our folk, replied Con. And if we... You and I, Con, are the only ones turned away. Phelim smiled weakly. Then, Phelim, we shall keep heading northwards, and not stop until we are old and grey. Con turned away and ordered his friend to see to the crew, while he kept an eye on what lay ahead. That ship of sorry souls drifted on the sea for three days and nights. They passed islands here and there, keeping the wind to their backs and pushing hard on the invisible course set by Con. The children grew restless. The women worked hard to comfort their kin and keep spirits alive. The crewmen remained silent and thoughtful. Con never left his post, and stood at the prow of the ship as though he were fixed in place. Day turned into night. Starlight became the passion of a Dane, and dusk transformed into dawn in the blink of an eye. Then, when the weary slept fitfully, a gasp was heard from their chieftain. By the gods, Con breathed. Dunain! Before them stood an island of mountainous peaks and crags, where the rock was surely split by the rays of the sun, and hollowed out by the biting ice and frost. What comes at us from the isle? Phelim stepped forward to stand beside Con. Con's hard stare was fixed ahead. He said, A ship, unlike any I have ever seen. 
Indeed, the ship was a thing of beauty, made by the expert hands of master craftsmen who knew well the arts of sorcery. For the sailors of Danaen approached not on a wooden vessel, but one made entirely of stone. The Boar King Spirited to the Dunain Isle, where the clans of Ulaith bayed, and into a low-lying valley, where the Hall of Stone was laid. The chieftain, a well-aged man, beckoned them into his hall, with fire and friendship to warm them, and a legend of the Boar King's fall. But scarce had a word been uttered when the ward of Padir arrived, she who was stricken and sightless, cursed by a wraith donned in height. Said Padir, this be one thing, and the other a turmoil at sea. Beira's ikvan adulam swallows those who strive to be free. A whirlpool of so violent a nature, Danane will perish the next day or not. But Betha, I beg you to free her, for death is all fate has wrought. At length Con considered the tale, Sleep banished by disordered thought, is kinfolk at last safe from danger, yet fate demanded a battle be fought. Con strode to the cave of despair, the walls awash with that long since past. There he saw in the days of olden, when the boar king had met his last. And the wraith appeared there before him, and his words filled the head of the brave, so did Con realize the true meaning. The wraith was as trapped as she to be saved. Said the king, I hear no music, I find no feast, I slay no beast from a bounding steed, I bestow no gold, I am poor and old, I am sick and cold, without wine or meat. Bera took what we treated so badly, what we had never been wise to have seen, that all things must live in some balance, and wrath was doled from that winter's queen. 
To my shame, I ran and abandoned all those she swept to the sea. For her tears caused the eek van adolem, her pain, the ways of dark misery. Those who linger too long in my cavern are stricken to live every day, with my past and what we had ravaged under the skies of gods disobeyed. But that is the price you pay, the shadow of my throne. For once you have seen the Boar King, sorrow is yours to own. Con replied, Free the ward of the chieftain Padir, we three shall put the whirlpool to rest, to destroy the Eek van Odolum. The last battle Bive set me when Ulid I left. The Boar King said, Go now, smite the Queen of the Wash. Three hundred years will be my gift to you. To the other world will I now journey, for my freedom is long overdue. Kath. The ward with flaxen locks he found, gazing out upon the sea. Tears she fought for the lost, she grieved sorrowfully. Con was alone in the cavern once more. The boar king vanished from sight. Carefully, he found his way through the narrow cavern, until light burst forth, and for a moment, blinded him completely. When his vision returned, he saw Betha standing looking over the edge of the cave mouth. He looked over her shoulder and saw the turmoil of the Eek van Odolum, the waves of misery. The swirling mass had ceased to be the sea. In its place was a churning, twisting maelstrom, and from it came the sound of a thousand cries the echo of those who had fallen victim to its grasp. Con knew in that moment it must be destroyed, and Bive had decided upon one more battle before he was ever to rest. He stepped out over the ledge 
and climbed the cliff face, higher and higher, ascending a mountain of granite. Upon reaching the summit, he withdrew the axe of Padir and swung its blade into the jagged peak. Over and over he struck the mountain and heaved great boulders into the sea. With all his might, Con roared in anguish as he fought with valour, but it was no good, and his will began to fade. As Con lifted the axe overhead, ready to strike once more, Betha's pale hand heaved her body over the edge of the precipice. As she stood face to face with the warrior of Uli, Con now saw her vision had cleared and her gaze was gleaming. You can't do this alone, Betha said and placed a hand on the axe. After every third swing, give it to me. And that is what they did. Their combined strength and determination rained down upon the mountain until it shuddered and began to quake. A torrent of stone, gravel and ice plunged into the sea as they kept on swinging. The axe head, made of quartz, began to glow as the Ichthanadulum's roars were drowned out by the landslide. Con and Betha did not hear the cry of the whirlpool, and when they could battle no more, they stood, filled with regret at what they had done. For though the waves of misery had been destroyed, so had part of Danain. We are no better than those in the days of the Boar King, whispered Betha. Con placed a hand on her shoulder. We can make amends. Three hundred years might be time enough. There was great joy upon the return of Betha and Con. Many a feast was held in celebration of what they had done. But their hearts remained heavy. One night, Con retreated from the hall and walked to what remained of the Boar King's cave. Surrounding him was a sea of gravel that glittered in the moonlight. He stooped and picked up a stone. As he rubbed the dust from its surface... He found it was the deepest shade of emerald green he had ever seen. Over the days and nights that followed, he smoothed the stone into a disc. Then he set it in copper and fixed it upon the cloak of Betha. What is this? she asked, amazed at the skill he had shown. The heart of Betha, he replied. To which she said, then you should be the one to wear it. Con never did wear it. He refused each day before they were wed, and each day that followed. Over the course of one hundred years, they carved the stories of their kinfolk into great slabs of stone and erected them across the island. Each stone came from the mountain they had brought down together. When at last Padir had come to the end of his long life, and his remaining breaths were few. He placed the axe into the hands of Con once more. With you, this island lives on. You will name it, and care for it as I have done in. Con gave a sorrowful nod and embraced Padir's hands within his own. I can think of no name that would do it justice, he said. But you will, replied Padir, as his eyes closed for the last time. Three days and nights of mourning passed. From the funeral pyre of Padir, torch was lit and left to burn inside the stone hall until it extinguished of its own accord. When Khan saw this, he took the wooden torch and buried it beneath the fallen mountain. In the morning, when he and the men of the island were gathered in the hall, Betha appeared in the portal. She approached him, much in the way she had on his first day in Danain. She silently took his hand and led him along the path that led to what had once been the Boar King's cave. There, on the stony ground, 
where once the giant's peak had been felled by their might and destroyed the wrath of the seas. Now stood a tree with leaves of emerald green and berries of crimson. There stood a rowan tree. Hadir told me I would come to know the name of our island, said Con. And you do, replied Betha. I do, my love, said Con, as he took her hand in his. This island, our home, will be known as Rowan Kath. Thank you for listening today. As always, please feel free to email on mlegendlore at gmail.com, hop on over to Twitter at LoreMyth, and check out our Facebook and YouTube channel, Myth Legend Lore. Take care for now. I'm Siobhan Clark, and you've been listening to the Myth Legend and Lore podcast. <laughs>